Ahoy! Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan, this is the show where we uncover all of the secrets hovering, lurking out there in the universe. This week, we'll take a look at a prehistoric shark that honestly has one of the most terrifying mouths ever. If you thought a a current shark's teeth were pretty scary, you've got no clue. Stick around for that. Also, you can hear about a real-life space plane that's actually working, and uh, it's a big show this week. I've got a very special announcement. Uh, It's coming up in a little bit. Stick around. Your question's in a sec, too. Before then, uh, let's help our space mates get back home. This is NNG. NNG's Meter Motivator. Hey, NNG. What's up, kid? Got a question about energy? Sure have. I want to be a smart meter motivator so I can help Gran and her friends. They're thinking of getting them installed. Thing is, I still don't exactly know how you get one or what happens when you do. Oh, smart Grand Human. She must be revered as one of your most high-thinking clever bots. Just an earthling that hates waste. But she's wondering how long it takes to get it set up. After all, she's a busy lady. She goes to Zumba five times a week. Hmm. Zumba. Isn't that in the Andromeda Nebula? Gosh, yes. She'll need all the energy she can get. Fear not. It's simple. Listen up. Your gran can contact the power company to make an appointment for the fitting at a time that's convenient for her. It's up to her when they come around and even if she wants to have a meter installed. And don't forget, it's at no extra cost. On the agreed day, an engineer will arrive. They'll do some important checks to make sure that the gas and electric power supplies are safely installed before switching them off whilst they do the work. They'll look at where the meters are and aim to replace them in the same place. There'll be one for electricity and one for gas. Each one will take about one of your Earth hours to fit. But remember... You won't be able to use the power supply during this time, so it's important to plan ahead. Especially in cold weather, Gran will need to stay warm. She'll probably make a flask of tea to tide her over. She does that normally, so she doesn't have to keep boiling the kettle. Oh, that's a cosmic way of saving energy. They would need to dig up the garden. Or the road. Or reroute traffic around the Dog Star Pulsar system. And when everything's installed, your Granny Clever Clogs can get a portable energy display that she can keep anywhere in her home. It'll show her everything working as it should be. Gran's really good with gadgets, but will the engineers help her to figure out how it works? Of course! She'll be shown how the energy display works so that she can see how much gas and electricity is being used. And she'll be given lots of tips about how it can help her start some serious energy watching. It could be helpful to have a friend along, someone who can ask questions too. And remember, once she has her smart meter, she won't ever need to take meter readings again, so the meters themselves can stay in their cupboards. And it won't change the amount she pays. The only thing that changes is the meter. Her tariff will stay the same. It'll just be easier to see how much energy she's using. She'll love that. And we love energy-saving Earthlings. Good work, meter motivator! Watch out! Looks like we're gonna fuse, G! Time for us to pop! Here it comes! Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion! See you, kid! Bye, NNG, and thanks! Here it comes! Find out how you can be a meter motivator with L and G with support from a smart energy GB. Find out more at fungislive.com slash energy. All right, then, question time on the show. This is, it's my favourite part. I love doing all the digging, finding out strange science facts I'd never even thought of before, and you really help out with that. If you've got a science question that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for me uh, over on Apple Podcasts. Find the Science Weekly, little comment box, that's where you stick your question. Uh, Gabrielle has done that. She wants to know, what are butterfly wings made out of? They're made out of two sheets of protein membranes. Membranes are kind of the outer layer of cells. Uh, now, they're covered. The, the wings are covered in thousands of scales as well and loads of tiny hairs. And they're colourful for two reasons. Uh, to help them camouflage 
and also to warn predators that they don't taste nice. Do you remember we heard about this when we were talking about venom recently on the show? We had a special guest and they said venomous creatures are bright, so it lets other animals know uh, I can do you some serious damage. It's a similar thing with the butterfly. Thank you so much, uh, Gabrielle. This one is from Dylan, who wants to know, he's seven years old, who wants to know, why do cars' wheels look like they are spinning backwards when they're going really fast on the road? This is called the wagon wheel effect. And it's kind of mind-blowing. Now, when you see something, you're you're not really watching a, a very clear video of everything that's happening all of the time. You're seeing hundreds of pictures that your brain stitches together. It makes them seem really smooth. Now, your eyes can see 200 of these pictures every single second, but your brain can only react to about 15 of those a second. Now, when you see something that's moving really quickly, it gets, it gets kind of too quick, and your brain can't figure it out. Now, your eyes will get a picture of the wheel that's spinning on the car in one place and then another and then another and then another and then by the time that your brain has made sense of it and smoothed it out it's tricked you so it looks like it's going backwards it's it's a mind warping effect thank you for the question dylan and lastly this is from valentin who is also seven who wants to know what is saliva made out of and why do we need it now saliva your spit is mostly water There are a few chemicals in there as well. The chemicals are really important because they help break the food down before it gets to your stomach. So it takes a little bit of work away from your belly. And it's it's mainly water. It helps you swallow things. It also cleans your mouth and rinses your teeth a little bit too. But that's no excuse to not brush your teeth, all right, just because your spit is doing it for you. Uh, if you've got something science that you want answered next week on the show, you need to leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly, and we hear a lot about climate change at the moment and how things harm the atmosphere. It turns out something strange is having a little impact too. Tree farts. As soon as I saw this, this is up our street, isn't it? So to find out more, we've got Melinda Martinez on. She's a wetland ecologist at the North Carolina State University over in Raleigh, and she joins us on the line. Melinda, thanks for being there. Thanks for having me. I love talking about tree farts. (laughs) Good. Good. Well, you've come to the right place. Uh, Now, listen, let's get it out there. What is a tree fart? Um, So a tree fart is basically greenhouse gases, that um, are being emitted by trees. So kind of like how in your own body, whenever you fart, you emit gases very similar to the same gases that are being emitted by um, standing dead trees. <laughs> now, wh- how, are the, how are the trees getting this gas in? We know that trees and plants take in carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. Mm-hmm. Why are these unwanted polluting gases coming in as well? So some of these greenhouse gases just occur naturally in wetlands. Um, and I guess first off, oh, if people aren't familiar with what a wetland is, it's literally just a wet land, <laughs> um, an area that's constantly saturated or has standing water for long periods of time. And so because there's so much standing water, um, these gases occur naturally because the more standing water, the less oxygen can penetrate the soil. And so this creates this uh, perfect environment for these microbial communities to produce uh, methane specifically. And this is one of the greenhouse gases that I was looking at. Um, And it's actually one of the gases people produce also internally um and so this uh, yeah this happens in uh in the soils and so when the trees are still upright and uh when they're standing dead trees a lot of the water is flushed out of the tree and so you have a lot of these open uh cells like a a network of open cells that allow some of the greenhouse gases that are produced in the soils to travel up the standing dead trees and then out into the atmosphere uh, you say out into the atmosphere with a human fart. We we know we know how they are released into the atmosphere. What about with a, with a tree fart? How does air? How does oxygen? Well, how does air rather and and greenhouse gases? How does it leave a tree? So it goes through 
uh the sides of the trees um as it goes further up the tree it gets um the concentrations are further reduced and so the highest there's more concentration higher concentrations of these greenhouse gases emitted closer to the base of the tree they slowly penetrate through the tree and then eventually make its way out kind of how <laughs> a fart does uh, in your own body um it's a very slow release now uh, with again with a human fart you know when someone's let one go don't you uh, you can smell it. How, um, how do you know when a tree has farted? How are, you, how are you telling which trees have farted and who's the culprit, whoever smelt it dealt with? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, there's, no, there's no smells um, because the, the, the reason why you hear fart smell is a combination. It's not just the same gases. You have other things happening within your own body. But um, here for standing dead trees um it's just co2 and methane and then small variants of nitrous oxide which is the third greenhouse gas um but one way is that uh one way that researchers uh look at how high the concentrations of methane are inside the trees is they'll they'll um take a tree core and after they take the tree core out, you can light the end of the tree core with a lighter. And if there's a, a big flame, that means that there's a, the very high concentrations inside the tree. And this happens because methane is super flammable. Ah, so it's, uh, again, we see this in films sometimes when people try and light their own farts. Definitely don't do that. Yes, do yes, you, because it's the like, methane. <laughs> it's the it's the methane. Um, but you scientists, <laughs> under controlled conditions, you have tried to set a light tree farts to see what's happening. Yes, yes. Some people do. It's just for show, just kind of to see how much of the methane is in, actually inside the tree. Now, how are they affecting the environment? We hear a lot about uh, cattle how cattle, cow farts and burps uh, affect the environment. How big a player are tree farts in global warming? Um, so this occurs, so I guess I mentioned standing dead trees are emitting greenhouse gases, but actually live trees do this as well. Um, but this is a little bit more complicated because um, in areas that aren't constantly saturated, there aren't wetlands, um, this is very small dosages uh, that are being emitted, but when you, when you have a lot of canopy or a lot of leaves um, in a live tree, some of that CO2 that's being emitted or some of that methane that's being emitted through the tree stem um, is taken up by the, pho by the leaves through photosynthesis. And so um, overall, globally, it's probably a very small percentage um, but this is just letting people know that this is a possibility too. like standing dead trees are definitely still emitting greenhouse gases. Um, but unlike the live trees, they don't have the leaves, uh, to take up some of that CO2 or carbon dioxide or methane, um, to help offset some of the emissions. How much of it is, is humans fault? Melinda, with uh, cattle farts, and you know, we're being told that perhaps if we were to eat less meat, there would be less of them around, so less cow farts. How much of tree farts and the fact that they are harming the environment a little bit, how much is that a human problem? I mean, I think in the grand scheme of things, um, it's not necessarily a huge problem because it's a, it's a small percentage. Um, globally but the reason why we're seeing so many standing dead trees um in the u.s or across the southeastern u.s in freshwater forested wetlands is because of in increasing flooding events and saltwater intrusion and some of that saltwater intrusion is caused by humans like human interference of the landscape amazing 
Uh, well, I've had a, a fantastic time uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean with all this technology involved, satellites at play, broadband, all of that, so we can talk about tree farts. It's been an absolute joy, Melinda. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we've got a creature that is no longer around, and you should be massively glad of that, by the way. The Helicoprion is a prehistoric fish. It looks a little bit like a shark. It lived over 250 million years ago. And you would find it all over the world. Fossils have been discovered and dug up in Russia, China, Australia, Mexico, Norway, loads of other places. Now, it looks like a big, thick shark, but it's even scarier. It's got one devastating twist. Now, it didn't have rows of teeth on the top of bottom like we do, or even like sharks do. Instead, it had a thick circle of teeth right in the middle of its mouth. Have you ever seen one of those circular saws that kind of handy DIY people have? Maybe you've seen one in your your dad's shed or something. Uh, It's the type of thing that's always trying to cut James Bond in half. A wheel with ridges of blades. Well, the Helicoprion had one of those, but instead of blades, it was covered in teeth, in teeth from top to bottom, and it split its mouth in half. It went right down the middle, and because of that, imagine that, because of that, it's known by a much more terrifying name, which means it earns its place on the Dangerous Dan list. We need to welcome in the Helicoprion, also known as the Buzzsaw Killer. Right, here's something very exciting. Uh, We're doing a Fun Kids Science Weekly live show. And you can come. It's in London on the 27th of August, which is the Friday of the bank holiday weekend here in the UK. So slap bang in your summer holidays. It's part of the Underbelly Festival, which is happening at Cavendish Square, which is uh, just off Oxford Circus, if you know London. And it's going to be amazing. Uh, It's the live show of the best podcast in the universe. We won the award and everything. So who knows? Maybe this might be the best show in the universe. We'll give it a go. It'll be full of uh, experiments and special guests. We'll uncover some more science secrets, hopefully. We'll get some dangerous stuff in there, of course. And you can also ask some science questions to an expert genius guest that we'll get. Now, hopefully you can come. It's the first Science Weekly live show that we've ever tried out. I've got my, all my fingers, all my toes crossed for it. Uh, the venues are quite socially distanced, uh, so it means there's not as many spaces as perhaps we could have. But you can nab one of those spaces right now. Tickets are on sale for the Fun Kids Science Weekly Live. It's happening on the 27th of August in London at two in the afternoon. Uh, You can make a day of it. You can grab your tickets right now over at funkidslive.com. It's time to get your weather update now. Not just weather, but climate and how weather is made. This is Marina Ventura. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers. Hi there, Marina Ventura here. I love finding out about the natural world, and that includes the Earth's climate. We know that weather can change from one day to the next, but climates can change too over the time span of years, centuries, or even longer. So I'm on a mission to fill MapApp with the latest climate information with the help of some awesome climate explorers. Come on then, let's go. A bit of rain is something we're used to in this country. Sometimes it's fun to get your wellies on and jump in some puddles. Rain is important for life, providing water to drink and keep clean and helping crops and plants to grow. People also like to live near water. It's relaxing and a great source of fun. But too much rainwater can cause very serious problems, causing rivers to overflow and flood the surrounding areas, filling houses, schools and shops with water. You can imagine how scary that might be and how much damage would be done if that happened in your neighbourhood. You might even have to leave your home to stay somewhere else. Climate explorers are very interested in studying rainfall and flooding to help us prepare for when these things happen and to help prevent them causing damage. That's right, Marina. It's something that's becoming more important. Rising global temperatures may cause heavier rainfall events as well as sea levels to rise. So flooding is something that's not going to go away. Time to meet our next climate explorer. Hi, I'm Kate and I'm a flood scientist. 
Floods kill more people than anything else on the planet and are something which can affect us here in the UK. We can't just hope they don't happen. We have to accept that they are a part of life and do our best to reduce the impact they have. Storm Desmond saw the highest ever amount of rainfall recorded in the UK in one day. Flooding isn't just becoming more frequent, but the levels of flood water are becoming higher too. In 2015, flooding in Cumbria broke some of our strongest flood defences. My job is to try to work out what will happen to rivers when there is a lot of rainfall. If we know where the river will overflow, then we can take measures to prevent damage to homes. Great to know there is something we can do. But how can you tell where the overflows will be? We can make computer models of rivers and chuck a load of virtual water into them. We keep going until the water starts to jump out. When there is a real flood, we collect real data to see if our models were correct, whether the areas with the most flooding match what our computer model predicted. Sounds like you get rather wet. Well, luckily we have a drone, a small flying robot that uses sensors like infrared and thermal imaging to take measurements. Ours is called Firefly. It flies above the areas affected to collect the data. Wow, I'd love to be a drone. We'll have to get you some wings. Thanks, Kate. Even though we can't easily prevent natural disasters like flooding, it's good to know that climate explorers are working hard to help us limit the damage they can do. It certainly is. The more we know, the better we can prepare. And now we know more about flooding too, don't we? Ready for upload, Nappy? Load me up. Next time, we'll be looking at how animals can help us understand changes to the climate. See you soon. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers, supported by the Natural Environment Research Council. The science of the natural world. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash marina. Let's do this week's science in the news. Prehistoric animal carvings, thought to be thousands of years old, they've been found in Scotland. It's the first time they've been seen. Reckon they're about 5,000 years old from the Bronze Age. And they include pictures of deer. Also, NASA's Perseverance rover is celebrating 100 Martian days, 100 souls up on Mars. It's hunting for signs of past life. It's been investigating the planet's rocks, makeup and climate, and been sending loads of photos back too. And finally, Virgin Galactic is a space plane, and it's conducted the first of three test flights before it hopes to fly tourists into space. It went up 55 miles into the air, then glided back down to Earth. And hopefully before the end of the year, it can do it properly. There's a waiting list of 600 people. Uh, It'll be quite expensive. Um, So mainly movie and music stars. They're going to take a trip to the edge of space. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you'd love to come along and watch Fun Kids Science Weekly live, amazing. Because I'd love to see you there. Uh, We'll get selfies, we'll get all of that, and we'll uncover some science secrets. Uh, You can get your tickets right now for the live show on the 27th of August at funkidslive.com. While you are there, it's one of the best places that you can hear uh, all of the brilliant podcasts that we make. You can get them on Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. They're on the free Fun Kids app too. If you've got a science question that you want answered, uh, I'd love to read that. Leave it as a review for us over on Apple Podcasts. And Fun Kids, we're a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com 